discussion uh, for around an hour and a half today. We have uh, guests who are here in this room in Washington, DC, and we also have guests who are online. Um, and we uh, welcome, we'll have a section as well for Q&A. So we also welcome um, as those who are online and, and here uh, with us to also uh, get ready for those sorts of questions and, and discussions as well. So uh, let me uh, in, let me uh, welcome uh, Honorable Malada Kaba to join us to give us the opening. A very good afternoon to you all. It's really a pleasure to be here, especially with my sister, and my partner in crime, Hannah Ryder, uh, the, the great CEO. So let me let me start without further ado. Honorable Jean-Paul Adam, Director of Policy, Monitoring and Advocacy in the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa to the U United Nations Secretary General. Dr. Hanan Morsi, my, sis my other sister, Deputy Executive Secretary at United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Dear Paolo Gomez, my brother, <laughs> Uh, founder of Orango Invest Corporation and many other things that I choose not to chose not to quote. Dr. Sifiso Falal, CEO of Sovereign Africa Ratings. Mr. Isaac Babatunde, Executive Director at Sovereign Africa Ratings. Ms. Zhang Tingting, Executive Director of Sovereign and International Ratings. My dear Hannah. Ryder, CEO of Development Reimagined, distinguished guests online and also here present, all protocol observed. Which is riskier, investing in Africa or sending men and women to the moon? I think we, we need to ask ourselves this question. Well, I, I did raise the question to people via social media and I also tested one of the um, AI softwares because it's all about artificial intelligence these days. And the answer I got was quite interesting. Um, so of course there is a caveat uh, via the, the survey on social media. It was not statistically significant, uh, but it's okay. 44% of the people of the respondents said that Africa was riskier to invest in and 56% thought that sending men and women to the moon was riskier. I believe though the answer is known to us, not because we are Africans, well, at least many of us here are, at Af are Africans in this room, but because Africa is on planet earth. So even if we have blind spots as investors, even if we do not have all the information we want about our continent and its 54 countries, it should still be possible to bridge those gaps. It should be possible to access funding crucial to meet our huge infrastructure needs. However, despite being on planet Earth, risk perception in Africa is not accurately addressed, and it results in a premium estimated to cost over $24 billion in excess interest and more than $46 billion in forgotten lending. This premium, combined with depreciation in exchange rates, which drove 60% of debt service costs in recent years, as estimated by the African Development Banks, adds on to the current financial woes of the continent. This is what I called the two treadmill challenge. This constant juggling to create and maintain the adequate fiscal space to ensure governments can meet their debts and other payments as they fall due, while raising the appropriate combination of patient capital to grow the economy, create jobs, and ultimately improve the lives of millions of people. So how do we change risk perception and increase the risk appetite of potential investors? I would like to offer my perspective on reimagining uh, credit rating in Africa and delve into some of the following points. We should remember not to focus on the snake and miss the scorpion, as an Egyptian proverb has it. We need to be clear about the problem we want to solve. 
The Scorpion is that Africa needs patient capital for its massive infrastructure development programs. But ac accessing capital should not come at higher costs for African economies, especially in light of what all economic theory theories tell us, that investments in poor countries should be more profitable than in already rich economies where capital is abundant. But this doesn't seem to factor in risk perception and possible bias. In this context, an African credit rating agency could help establish a more objective assessment based on quantitative and qualitative data. Such an agency should also help better capture the specificities of countries' context, which is still marked by the prevalence of informality. And I believe that this matters greatly and should be maybe part of one of the value additions of such an organization. Furthermore, being on the continent, sorry, being on the ground also offers the opportunity to enhance stakeholder engagement and understand the business cultural nuances. Earlier this year, my consultancy compared ratings for some countries on the continent made by an African-owned credit rating agency and the big threes, as we like to call them. And we found, of course, some differences with the local agency ratings being more favorable than the big three. But it doesn't mean that the assessment was less rigorous. It may mean, though, that the local credit rating agency may have considered domestic aspects not completely captured by the big three. This could be the cultural nuances that Japan was keen to consider when it set up homegrown agencies in the mid 80s. But Japan is not the only country that has experimented local credit rating agencies. So we are not starting from scratch and we should maybe learn the lessons from both successful and failed attempts. When it comes to Africa, a prerequisite to success is to know what we do not know. Establishing an African credit rating agency means that we must overcome some of the challenges also faced by international agencies. Lack of sufficient hard data on African economies is a major one. According to the 2023 report of the Open Data Inventory, which assesses the coverage and openness of official statistics on a scale of zero to 100, 33% of African countries scored between 20 to 40 and 35% between 40 to 60. This shows that there is room for improvement in terms of collecting, analyzing, and releasing pertinent data uh, for a wide range of users, including investors. The quality, timeliness, and availability of data is crucial. This will be key to establish the credibility of an African credit rating agency together with objectivity, high standards, and analytical robustness. In this regard, leveraging artificial intelligence and other digital tools should be maximized. But increasing data availability must also be combined with a good understanding of how these international agencies operate. Understanding their methodology underpins one's ability to challenge their assessments. South Africa, for instance, which was the first continent to be rated, uh, which was the first country to be rated on the continent, has a long-standing experience with dealing with credit rating agencies. In this context, current capacity building initiatives by the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa are welcomed and should also foster South, South cooperation as well as learning and sharing between countries. Challenging credit ratings may not necessarily change the outcome, we know that. However, it, should, it would send a signal that while putting things into perspective, countries do not just accept ratings as such. So as we need to understand that the value of an African credit rating agency will be largely determined by investors' use of what it produces, I still think that we need to ask ourselves how an African credit rating agency will really be a game changer in the risk perception about Africa. And should the broader discussion not be about African countries' ability to leverage credit ratings to raise capital on the continent in local currency, 
and also on international markets and to leverage and to boost much needed reforms. In as much as an African credit rating ag agency may be seen as a solution, I also believe that it will take time to set it up. It will come with its own challenges about staffing, funding, and governance. Therefore, we should also use what we have and work with the credit rating agencies already on the continent in the interim period and leverage part of their work to further support the development, integration, and deepening of African capital markets. Why? Because again, this is the real issue at hand when we talk about financing for development, the ability that our governments can have to raise patient capital in local currency or in a common currency. I would like to suggest a three-pronged approach where the African credit rate, where an, an African credit rating agency, a local private credit rating agency, and the big threes could be used for different yet mutually reinforcing purposes based on which capital market we target. An African credit rating agency could be useful to raise capital for regional investments in the context of the African continental free trade area and for regional infrastructure programs. Ratings of regional economic communities could maybe also be another value addition we are looking for. I would see this as an interesting positioning complementing what already exists. Also, the big three will not go away. Let's be very realistic about that. <laughs> However, strengthening regulation and oversight while also enhancing the way we engage with them through capacity building and peer learning that is already ongoing may yield positive results. Lastly, the discussion about risk perception is intrinsically related to owning and shaping our African narrative. It is about writing our stories, but it must be complete stories as our famous Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie said, and let me quote her, the single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. So I put to you this question, which story do we want to tell about our beautiful continent? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Malada. Thank you very much for your engaging and insightful keynote, setting the stage for our discussion today, and not just about the African Credit Rating Agency and what it can do, but also about what the other credit rating agencies can do, but also others who are involved in uh, discussing and working on African um, development. So I think you've set the stage for us very well for this discussion. And um, I'm going to now invite uh, our the two other panelists who are going to be joining us here uh, on the stage. Um, and uh, and also online, uh, we have uh, two others as well who will be joining us um, as for for the discussion. So um, let me introduce first of all Dr. Hanan Morrissey, uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary and Chief Economist of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Um, please do join us uh, on the stage. There. Thank you. And. Let me also introduce uh, Mr. Paolo Gomez, also a very good friend of ours, the founder and uh, and of Arango Investment Corporation, and also strongly involved in uh, much of our uh, the development and invest investment projects and banks um, on our continent. Former executive director at the World Bank as well. Uh, online. Uh, we have joining us uh, Dr. Sufiso Falala, uh, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Sovereign Africa Ratings. Hello, everyone. We also have uh, Mr. 
Isaac Babotunde, who is the executive director of Augusto and Co, another uh, African um, ratings company. We have Ms. Zhang Tingting, who's the executive director of Sovereign and International Rating for China Changxi International. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Honourable Mr. Jean-Paul Adam, who will do our closing remarks for us, uh, the Director of Policy and Monitoring and Advocacy for the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa uh, at the UN um, Secretariat, and also a former Minister of Finance as well for uh, Seychelles. So thank you um, all for joining us. Um, I'm going to come to you first, uh, Dr. Morrissey. Um, you work with a lot of African governments, of course, um, helping them to coordinate on a whole range of issues and, and providing technical support uh, to them. Uh, in our analysis at Development Reimagined, we found uh, just through a, you know, a few searches, we found at least 28 statements from across 12 different African countries over uh, the last 10 years saying that there were problems and challenges with the credit rating, um, sovereign credit rating uh, agencies and, and particular statements that had that had been, or certain ratings that had come out. Um, in your view, we wanna, we're gonna talk, talk a bit in depth about, you know, what are the, what are the methodological issues that underlie why they might be making those statements. Dr. Morrissey, what's your understanding of the challenges that African governments face and, and feel with the actual methodologies that they see um, the, the credit rating agencies use? Uh, thanks, Hannah. I think what we're, when, when we're thinking of what are the issues with, um, you know, the credit ratings that uh, African countries tend to end up with, uh, a key issue here is, uh, you know, there are certain established methodologies for all these firms on how they go about the assessments. Uh, when you have the data that they typically use available uh, and considered reliable, uh, they don't have an option but to use it. I think what opens more room for subjectivity is the fact that some of this data is lacking for African countries, which means that it opens the door more for, uh, you know, um, subjective assessments, uh, less quantitative, more qualitative based on their views. Uh, and that actually tends to be not in favor of African countries. So. Uh, I think the number one issue is availability of reliable, credible, regular data from the side of African countries. Then this creates that room for more discretion. Uh, the second issue, uh, which is the fact that um, you know most of um, you know the analysts that are dealing with these ratings are actually not based, I think, I would say all, probably for the big three. Um, if there is, there would be very few exceptions. So most of it tend to be based elsewhere, whether, you know, in Europe or in Dubai or elsewhere. Um, so basically you don't have that kind of in-ground knowledge and feel of what is going on. And this was actually one of the reforms that were implemented in the European Union after the European crisis about regulations that whoever is doing actually the assessment have to be based within the European Union. Uh, they cannot be sitting in the US and rating, you know, whether Greece, Portugal, or whichever country they are rating. So I think part of that issue is what is the current regulatory framework like? Uh, and then that brings me to another, yet another issue, which is, um, you know, if you have, um, if you're uh, uh, discontent and disagree with a rating, 
what is the mechanism that is available to you. Currently, the only mechanism is internal recourse mechanism within one of the big three companies, meaning you uh, don't agree with Moody's, you have to go through Moody's internal recourse mechanism, okay? Uh, well, even at individual level, if we are not I don't know, happy with a, our financial, our bank that we deal with, we go through their internal recourse mechanism, but there is an oversight body, you know, whether you call it financial, you know, um, regulatory uh, um, body or financial conduct authority or whatever it is, but there is a higher body that actually have the oversight to ensure that they follow, uh, you know, basic rules and principles. In this case, it's not there. It's just the internal recourse of that uh, big rating agency, but there is no international, uh, you know, um, oversight that kind of can rule over whether this is actually was done properly or not. Uh, so these are some of the issues. So part of it, in, in my view, what it means for us is there are a number of things we need to work on. At the national level, we need to invest in our infrastructure and in our data to have that required uh, uh, indicators and data regularly available and credible that leaves you know no room for this kind of uh, uh, discretion it's it need to be more quantitative based second we need to work on issues of regulation uh, we need to look at you know what has been done elsewhere we i mean one idea is to have it at a global level uh, in bodies like, you know, Financial Stability Board, uh, or to do uh, similar to what the European Union did, to have basically that oversight with an, you know, a continental approach uh, that requires, but that requires, of course, harmonization of these requirements across countries that require that you know, analysts or companies that are doing this cannot be doing this while sitting elsewhere. Okay, so that's another area where we, you know, need to uh, work on to correct. And then that also opens the other thing of having a way by which you have the checks and balances for what they do. So if you disagree, they, you know, there is an, another, you know, higher body that you go to and you need to show how inconsistent it is or, you know, not really in a comparative sense. Uh, not fair or what is the behavior and prove that, you know, from your side and have that disputed. So these are some of the things that I think that takes us to the issues that we're talking about. I'm, I'm happy to come on more issues, but let me stop here. Brilliant. And again, very helpful in terms of setting out the three particular issues, the data kind of discretion gap, the location gap in issues, and also this question about regulation and the potential for action on all of those. And I think we will explore all of those um, in, in, as, we, as we go forward. I want to delve a bit more into this question of, of, uh, of discretion and I wonder also whether there is some degree of learning that can be done from uh, credit rating agencies that are outside um, of the big three. And I want to bring in a comment um, from uh, Ms. Zhang Tingting. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, executive director at uh, China Chongqing International. Um, and we asked her, um, from, from your perspective, what are the key differences in the philosophy of Chinese credit rating agencies in terms of the sovereign ratings that they do compared to the traditional um, big three international rating agencies and how that might drive differences in terms of the dis discretionary element? Zhang Tingting. Hello, everyone. This is Christine Zhang, uh, Executive Director of Sovereign and International Rating Business of CCXI, uh, one of the largest local credit rating agency. So today, I'm really glad to be invited to this conference and uh, share, you know, share my view on this important and interesting topic. 
Mm, so talking about the landscape of the global rating business, uh, the, the first point I would like to make is that, you know, we know that the big three now dominates the global rating business with over 90% market share. But, you know, in each continent and in each country, there are so many local CRAs that are also playing a very critical role in their local financial markets. So compared with this uh, big three, the local CRAs do have a better understanding of their local financial markets and local issues, and even more accepted by the local investors. So uh, you know that it is very common for the in, big three to neglect this kind of regional differences in the international scale rating. But uh, from my point of view, these kind of regional differences is exactly the advantages of the local CRAs. And that also results in different methods and views we took even on the same entity. The second point I would like to uh, make is that sovereign rating is very important because uh, sovereign rating is the basis of global scale rating and it plays a critical role as a country setting for the related entities. While among the sovereign rating methodologies, uh, the institutional and the political factor really plays a uh, key difference role. Um, as you know, these kind of factors are mostly considered to be subjective instead of objective, uh, qualitative instead of quantitative. So take CCXI as an example. Um, we took a different approach in assessing the sovereign rating compared with big three. Uh, for example, we don't uh, use those indicators uh, that are totally subjective and biased. For example, the voice and accountability. And instead, we would consider the factors like uh, government strategic planning and ex ex execution. According to the big three, actually, China's scores for voice and accountability, rule of law, control of corruption, you know, uh, are among the lowest among all countries. And if you look at the data sources of these of these indicators, you know, most of them come from the Western think tanks. Well, from our point of view, uh, we do consider that the institutional advantage of China is actually the key driver for the rapid growth of China during the last past a few years. So this is exactly, you know, shows the difference of our different view on the sovereign rating system. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Giantini. And I think that that sets out again, you know, different perspectives and this this question around subjectivity and discretion. How do you really how do we avoid that going forwards? But as Dr. Morrissey was saying, in terms of the extra data, perhaps there might be. But I think there's still a question as to what what kind of data would you do? You, do you even need data around some of these indicators, or should we actually be using other ones, um, which might be useful? And I'm I'm looking forward to the the views of of those who um, uh, who are managing the sovereign rating agencies as well in Africa to to also come in on that question. Before I do. Um, Paolo, um, you work with a lot of different investors and also in terms of, um, you know, how they use the, the credit rating agencies. Um, what what challenges have you seen or, or inconsistencies might have you seen in this sort of, it, are there issues around methodology that the credit rating agencies use that perhaps investors have to overcome when they go into the African continent? Yes, I think Dr. Mossi has uh, kind of mapped out very well some of the the, the, the many issues related to data, um, uh, yeah, the issue of methodology with some, you know, if you look at S&P, uh, they basically have those five factors with uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative, uh, monetary, economic, and then you have the external and fiscal. Um, Look, rating agencies are basically our uh, intermediary with our uh, investors. Um, so it, it, it's basically how basically you, you position someone to describe your qualities um, to someone else. Um, 
and that can be problematic when the person you are asking to evaluate yourself has something in the region of 90% of the, the market share. So it's a very comfortable guy, you know, very happy where it is. So you need to kind of understand him. I think we have to understand their point of view or where they stand. I mean, Bob Marley used to say, who you are is where you stand in this struggle. Um, and, and paraphrasing my sister, um, Balado uh, 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 on the issue of going to the moon. And I think Kennedy was saying that uh, we have decided to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And I think we have to do a hard thing as Africans. Uh, and my sense is that it's the reality of things. Last year, we had a debate of this thing. We have to see that this guy, this trade agency are part of an ecosystem and they will continue in that ecosystem. In our side, I think we need to do homework, a very solid homework as a country before you engage with them. And if you do your homework, what you're gonna learn from it? You're gonna learn first that the guy has a bias toward yourself. He has issue of data and it goes back to the issue of the data, what data you are talking about. And also how you're gonna engage him. Uh, if you don't know how you're gonna engage them during the calendar year, a small analyst based in uh, whatever place in Europe will speak on your behalf. So I think insisting on the homework, so at the country level, you take into account those issues that the methodology that they have, the, the, the quality of or the robustness of the analysts, the lack of data, once you understand all of this, then you engage into a rating exercise. I don't advise any country to get into that rating exercise without doing the homework. And homework that will enable you each year to know how you're gonna engage with them during the year. You don't wait until the, the rating is out, engage with them. So the same thing with the investor, because the investor basically, many of them are not basing really their decision on those rating. It's part of the exercise. But I think if you find the time to engage with them in a parallel track with the a rating agency, you will be surprised how the investor himself will discount some of the results that will come from the trading from the rating agency. Uh, so that has been my experience. They know they have people, investors have also their people inside the house that will do the homework, but they are open to some discussion about it. So I think my recommendation again, and based on what UNHCR and others are doing to support the countries is to prepare the country before even he got into an exercise of rating. So you have a team in the Ministry of Finance. I mean, a, a private company will call it an investor relationship. So make sure in the Ministry of Finance, you have uh, a, 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 a rating relationship agent, you know, in the office of the, 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 the whatever, the prime minister of the Ministry of Finance. So the guys has to know the animal very well. Uh, and it is not difficult to train it. You have also to, in your team to have a sense of who, whose investor you are targeting. Because I don't think we, you, are go, you have to go in a blind way of just fishing around uh, uh, the investor. You have to have a sense what who is the investor you want to target in your process. So to know them, and then you know the rating agency will come as an additional uh, element in, in the process you, you intend to, to implement. So those are the points that I would like to complement to at Dr. Mossi as a raise uh, earlier. Yeah, thank you very much, Paolo, because, I mean, again, it's number one, we have to remember that, like you said, it's an ecosystem and the credit rating agency is not the be all and end all, but nevertheless, it has some influence, but going to one, understanding the methodology and being proactive and intentional um, can make a significant difference. I'm all, I'm interested in, in to what degree I want to bring in um, Dr. Falala and also uh, Mr. Babatunde um, and Dr. Falala first, perhaps. Um, you uh, you run um, rating agencies uh, on the continent. 
how do your methodologies differ and how do you deal with some of these questions that Dr. Morrissey and and others have raised in terms of um, kind of reducing that gap between uh, the the data and the and the qualitative aspect of of the of the rating. So over to you, Dr. Falala. Yes, yeah, th thank you very much, and uh, good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, uh, the word agency, I think, explains everything that needs to be said and everything that needs to be known about agencies. If you look at the provision of the agency theory, it explains that an agent acts on behalf of the principal and that an agent carries out the orders of the principal. And therefore, one cannot understand the actions and decisions of an agent without understanding the purposes and the aims of the principal. And in this case, I think there's a common uh, misunderstanding that, uh, especially in Africa where ratings are being implemented, that ratings agencies are representing African countries as a principal. This is not the case. African countries have never been and will never be a, a principal uh, uh, on whose behalf the agencies are acting. And so that's the, the first point of departure for us is that African countries are the principal um, in our case, and then uh, investors also equally then are principals. And to that extent, um, agencies would be forgiven, especially the leading three across the world for a perception that they are biased against uh, the developing world and, and maybe even more so the African continent. They have never, as far as I have, a, 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 an accurate recollection, they have never pretended to represent an African agency. They have never said that they're out there to serve African interests. So the fact that there's an assumption that they might in some way act um, with African interests in mind is in itself uh, quite puzzling because that, that's not really uh, what they're there to do. When they started um, early 20th century, they were doing corporate ratings and eventually found their way um, into sovereign ratings. And therefore, an assumption that they would act in the interest outside of the purview of the methodologies that have changed very, very slowly over time with some of the most recent modifications uh, being in um, the 1980s, um, and to this day, the methodologies that I use remain very outdated. Not only is there subjectivity, such as, for instance, what is commonly referred to as notching, and in some cases, qualitative overlay, which is uh, a way of saying that we will decide what the rating will be. But also, you have all these sets of uh, alphabets and numbers which make it easier for subjectivity to prevail. So one of the areas that we have made a distinction because our agency is with a different, uh, certainly not the 20, an early 20th century audience, but really a 21st century uh, audience and the global order that has changed and the global economy that has changed is to refine, for example, the alphanumeric system and to make it more quantitative. Another um, area that we have endeavored to do a sovereign Africa ratings in, in Africa, and especially in South Africa, is to try and attain methodological and scientific rigor. In other words, statistical purity, which again is not um, something that you're guaranteed by the, the, the major agencies. I will not, I don't think there's time to go into any of the, of the contestations of their findings because they are not really the the, the main aim of the discussion. The main aim is to reflect on what the continent uh, can do in order to bring into view um, its own uh, credibility and credentials as a, as a principle um, in the business of uh, being rated or getting objective ratings to take place. And it is on that basis that we have evolved not just dimensions that cover the ones that are covered by other agencies, 
for example, the economic fundamentals, those are critically important. We have evolved those, but we have additional fundamentals that reflect the asset base of the continent. And the asset base of the continent does include the riches that are inherent uh, on the continent. Um, one of the important areas that needs to be noted in terms of those riches is that you've got two types of investors on the continent. On the one hand, you have a hunter kind of investor. And some of the hunter investors, for example, tend to be Fortune uh, 500 companies. I can give examples like ExxonMobil, Glencore, Anglo-American, to name but a few. And these are heavily invested in, in Africa, despite the, the negative ratings. And these substantial profits in, in billions um, in Africa, despite the, the negative ratings. So the question to be asked then is, why would Fortune 500 companies um, invest so heavily and make large billions of, of, of dollars of profit um, in a continent that if you look at the downgrades for Nigeria, for South Africa and the sub-sovereign sub-investment ratings for countries like Ghana, Namibia, um, and Kenya and others that have not actually defaulted, you begin to wonder as to what is the logic. The logic, of course, is that you also have gatherer investors that pick up on where the hunters uh, cannot pick up, and they come with a different mindset. So the net effect is to have uh, um, more credit ratings agencies. I don't believe that there should be one African credit rating agency. I think there should be many. And I think uh, the, the role of the African Union in this case is to accredit uh, credit rating agencies that present credible methodologies um, so that it is not accused of uh, selectivity and of bias in, in how it um, how ratings are done, that there is no favoritism, but rather there is objectivity. So we can't replace problem A with B, uh, but oriented uh, uh, differently. So our experience has been that by introducing the resources and also infrastructure development and noting that of the top 12 fastest growing economies in the world, at least six of those are in Africa, we feel that our ratings are are quite accurate. We actually are not surprised that our ratings are not aligned with the ratings of the global agencies because their agency is different and their principles are different. And they have never claimed methodological purity and they never will. And to that extent, um, the fact that for South Africa, for instance, we are several notches above some of these agencies and still investment grade, we do not believe that South Africa is in junk status. We think it is a figment of the imagination that South Africa is in junk status. We would never agree with that. It is just a fact. And therefore, the way that you have uh, these, these ratings, the way that they are, we've rated Ghana, we've rated Kenya, and we continue to rate African markets. Um, and as we do so, we find that our results reflect an improvement because we take into account things like the natural assets, which as I've mentioned, are exploited by the hunter uh, types of investors, but then at the same time shunned by the gatherer types of, of investors. So that, that is the challenge we, we are facing in, in brief is that in order to secure um, the business to rate more countries in, in Africa, most African states do not have any decision-making authority. Uh, the reason being that money makes the decisions. So the agency and the principal is tied to the cartel that controls the information that is fed into the investment system. And the information that is fed into the investment system is the one that determines where investment will, will go. And the people that determine the information that goes into the investment system, they are the same people that decide which agencies are going to be used. And this is not based on the purity or accuracy of the data, as we've seen with some of the other case studies and contestations in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, uh, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in the United States itself. So this has got nothing to do with, uh, it is just a cartel. 
And the solution really may um, reside with Africa shortening its planning regimes. Africa has to look at itself and look at how Africans can invest in other African countries and how the continental free trade area can be more effective and made more effective so that there's more trade between Africans and the agencies operating uh, in a way that is not completely subservient to the global financial markets, which do what I expect them to do. That is to say, look after number one first, which is their interest. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And you've you've raised a lot of related issues there, but I think I saw a lot of heads nodding. Um, and also, let me also just remind, um, first of all, our audience uh, here and online, please have your questions ready for when we get to Q&A. Um, but also our other panelists, please also do feel free if you want to add or, um, you know, kind of build on another point that, that another fellow panelists have made you know, let's let's have this as a kind of dynamic conversation. Um, Mr. Babatunde, I want to come to you um, again, kind of putting a very similar question to you in terms of, you know, how does your approach uh, at Augusto and Co, how does that, how does your approach differ? And do you find that there are significant data gaps or or is it really about what kind of methodology you're looking out for? Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the discourse or imagine credit rating agencies for Africa and their priorities. Uh, first of all, by way of introduction, Augusto and Co is the pioneer rating agency. It's a pan African rating agency that is headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria, with branches in Kenya and Rwanda, from where we cover the East African countries, and recently Ghana to reinforce our operations in West Africa. By and large, our international sovereign rating methodology is similar to the big three. However, our ratings are usually about one or two notches different. Uh, the, our rating methodology includes looking at the national outputs, key economic uh, prices, central government finances, external finances, political environment uh, and stability, demography, and uh, employment. However, about 40% of our rating criteria are largely qualitative in nature. And this we're able to measure because of our local knowledge. We reside in and are familiar with the happenings in the countries that we rate. And therefore, we're able to bring local perspectives to the rating process. In most cases, the big three fly in to carry out ratings, most of which are unsolicited. When a rating is unsolicited and the agency has no local knowledge, there will be no opportunity to validate the data input used in arriving at the rating. When ratings are unsolicited, missing information will impede objective opinions regarding the country's economic situation and outlook. Ordinarily, when ratings are solicited, it will involve sending questionnaire to client following that with a kind of pre-rating meetings to have a better understanding of the entity being rated. So, and uh, after we have done that, we have done some analysis, we usually share the draft report with the client so that any inaccurate information will be clarified and any opinion that we express that they have disagreement with and the reason will be provided. With that, it will provide some kind of um, transparent uh, process for the rating uh, exercise. But when these are not um, applicable, there's the likelihood of a disagreement with the rating outcome. When ratings are unsolicited, there is no provision for appeal. When you disagree with the outcome, you cannot appeal the rating. Because normally, in the process of rating, when a client is dissatisfied with the outcome of the rating, you can actually appeal to the rating committee and provide additional information which can be used to reappraise the client and then uh, come up with more objective uh, uh, opinion. Now, despite that some of our ratings, software ratings in Africa are largely unsolicited, we still incorporated the uh, meeting sections with economic managers of um, 
and debt management offices of the countries, especially in East Africa, to get better understanding of the workings of the government and plans for the near to medium term. So in essence, lack of non local knowledge of the African economy is a major impediment to the rating process of the big three. So this creates a kind of bias and misunderstanding. So inaccurate rating outcome will be the result. And this will lead to high risk premium for the sovereigns in assessing credit and also provide limited opportunity for access to finance. So to avoid this, uh, CRA must consult with government representatives during the rating process to ensure credibility of the uh, rating outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Babatunde. So you've pointed to some, also some very specific points, and I think, again, coming back to a point that, uh, that Dr. Morrissey had mentioned around the localization aspect and how that was something which was even introduced by um, other regions as a requirement. Uh, you are mentioning that as something which also, when you do have that localization, then methodology will certainly, or the outcomes and the data itself will be superior uh, in terms of the overall rating um, and information that goes in, you know, whatever data there is that governments provide. So I think that's that's a really interesting point. Um, and and you've also explained how how your um, how your ratings differ. Um, Malada, I want to come back to you in terms of, you know, if we're if we're to think about kind of what what is next in terms of methodologies in particular, um, but again dealing with some of these questions around discretion or um or extra data or even just having a broader number of sovereign rating agencies in itself, which is what uh, Dr. Falala has mentioned. What do you think is, you know, are all of these things absolutely necessary? What what should be prioritized? I think, so, so first of all, I would like to, um, again, you know, come back to a point raised by Dr. Sifiso um, Falala. Um, on the underlying contradiction that exists, you know, between um, the, the risk perception uh, from uh, international rating agencies and 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 yet, which which seems to contradict actually large corporates behaviors in our in our countries, um, and and in, for me an example uh, that is uh, quite striking is uh, seeing uh, a such a, a major. Uh, a company as a Rio Tinto, you know, not hesitating to strike a deal in Guinea. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a multi, multi billion uh, dollar deal in, in a country led by a military junta. <laughs> so they are still there, right? And 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 I'm, I'm not sure that if we were to get a, a rating by one of the three uh, or the three international agencies, I think it would be probably catastrophic. I, I mean, I, I would I would suppose so. So I think that contradiction, we need to keep it in mind, especially as we engage, as our African institutions engage uh, um, uh, on our behalf, you know, to to solve these issues in in uh, in global fora. So, in, in in terms of the priority, I don't know. I think as as always, <laughs> everything seems to be seems to be um, seems to be key. But but for me, relying on well, I think strengthening um, our uh, use of uh, con current and existing African. Uh, rating agencies such as um, uh, August, sorry, Augusto, uh, yes, uh, Augusto, and and pardon me, I I uh, I, I made you work to for uh, the the agency of Mr. Falala, but agencies like like these and and there are others also in West Africa in in Francophone uh, West Africa as well. Um, I think it is important that we make recourse to those agencies because they know our context better uh, because they also some somehow make some innovations if i take for instance uh, bloomfield investment uh, 
um, I, I've been following them uh, quite closely. Uh, they have introduced ratings of uh, local municipalities in, in some of the countries they've rated. Uh, they're also uh, looking at rating um, some, of the, some of our countries in, in, um, in, 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 in Francophone West Africa according to local currency um, uh, denomination. And I think this, this matters a lot. Um, another aspect for me is also to consider the informal sector. I know it is complicated, uh, but we cannot ignore that given given the the, the weight uh, this sector has um, on our economy. So making recourse to African to local, well, I don't like to say local because it's it makes them little, but they're not they're not small. Making recourse to our uh, existing African rating agencies is absolutely critical. We must use them a lot uh, so that they also. Uh, I would say increase the footprint footprint on the continent, while at the same time working to establish a bigger entity, or or maybe while looking to 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 yeah you know see having a an African agency that probably could look at a regional aspect. I think to complement what. Um, these existing African um, uh, rating agency do? Because I think we really need also to look at um, leveraging uh, the strength of each players, but also complementing and not duplicating, because this is something that we, this is a trap we, we tend to fall into also often. Um, and um, I also wanted to um, strengthen the point made by uh, Paolo in terms of the preparation. Um, when I was um, an economy and finance minister in, in Guinea um, um, several years ago, um, I was preparing uh, with also his support um, to actually conduct first a shadow rating of my country. Uh, but I was very, I would say, strategic and intentional. Strategic in the sense that, you know, I wanted first to finish with our IMF program. And I knew we were actually on the good on a good track, you know, um, improving all our macroeconomic fundamentals. Um, then it was also for me about to think about our storyline. What do we want to tell the world? And it is important. And I think Hanan or, or Paolo mentioned it. You need to be intentional and and strategic in uh, choosing the, the the market you want to go to and you want to raise your capital. Um, so that that's uh, that's a second thing. Working also on our data, making sure that we would be able to produce you know more data was something very important. Uh, and we started so we started engaging with um, also the the those international agencies. Um, you know, getting to know them better. Uh, I remember coming here in DC and sat with. Uh, each of them, you know, in in uh, in separate meetings, so to to start to understand. I think this is very important, and you need to have some people in 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 your ministries. Uh, you know, the, the go to people uh, that will definitely master uh, the methodologies, even though we understand that so, uh, it's flawed somehow. But I think it's it's also well, it's it's part of the game. So let's also play that game while, of course setting our own uh, agencies and strengthening those that are already um, in existence. Um, I, I think this is uh, this is critical. So uh, yeah, I hope I've, I've answered your, your question. You have, you have. Um, and I think, yeah, as you're, as you're saying, I'm, I'm really grateful that you also shared your experience of having kind of worked in this e on these issues. And, and it reminds me actually of the of the example of Argentina when they were negotiating their debt sustainability assessment with the IMF. They did their own debt sustainability assessment first at home, and then you know, like you're saying, do a shadow and then go out and 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 so on. Or maybe it's a case of use an African sovereign rating agency and then also engage with the others. Perhaps these are the sorts of um, sorts of strategies that governments can use. So, yeah. Sorry, in my case, actually, the sh I, I had planned to do the shadow with an African, uh, with Bloomfield, uh, not to name them, but yeah. Yeah. So that, okay. So, so you combined both, in fact, exactly. um, which is also an interesting um, opportunity um, and can, again, sort of uh, drive up um, the the demand from from on the on the African side as well. Um, Dr. Morrissey, um, you've heard about 
you know, we've, we've been discussing about these the the different opportunities. What do you think are the priorities in terms of next steps? I think the priorities are really centered around the areas that we have discussed, building, um, you know, investing in data and, you know, supporting infrastructure for that, working on the regulatory side. Um, I completely agree with my colleague here about what he emphasized in terms of building capacity on communication. So I think these are the important areas, but also uh, we need to also be uh, like realistic in terms of what it means. Uh, I think it's it's a good um, uh, it's a good thing that we start to develop our own like you know credit rating agencies, but we need to also um, be mindful that. Part of what uh, you know builds uh, the the uh, attractiveness of the global ones is the track record. It took took some of them like you know almost a hundred years to kind of you know build that track record relations with investors trust in them. So it takes time, okay. And what helped also is that they have uh, this kind of like comparability that you have a large sum because you have also across your rate, not rating one region, but you're rating across the globe. So uh, we need to be realistic in terms of what, what can be achieved with having this. It's a very important step forward. And let me say why I think it's important because uh, it's really important, particularly for businesses and local banks. Okay, to have this track record of having unique evaluations of like creditworthiness of these local entities that can, you know, be a very good basis to attract for indirect investments, to, uh, you know, build a history for these like, you know, credit history for these entities. So it's it, it plays a crucial role. But what I'm saying is for the sovereign, I mean, it's going to take time. So we need to um, be also realistic of what it means for the sovereign, that this is good because it gives us some different ways to think about things, perhaps a, you know, um, alternatives in terms of what you can put forward and arguments. And uh, we need to also build that internally within governments and ministries of finance to do so. But that's, that's an important perspective. But just to... Uh, kind of like balance the expectations of what it means um, and, you know, uh, who will be using it and how. But I think uh, they they are more than critical role for the domestic market and having that credit history and, you know, increasing the, the attractiveness of investing in local firms and domestic banks. So, Dr. Morsi, let me let me come back to you. Do you think, for example, some of the some of the kind of methodological differences, things like taking into account the informal sector or um, or some of the natural asset base as well? You know, we're in Washington D.C. or in the U.S. at least. Um, this is the home of several credit rating of those big three credit rating agencies. To what degree do you think it's worth African governments in some way, perhaps even collectively saying these are the things that we think that you should be actually taking into account in credit ratings going forwards and, and making those proposals? Okay, so... I think the question that can be bounced back to us is how does this, what revenues, okay, does this generate for you? Okay, how are you actually monetizing that? And how does it affect your, uh, uh, you know, ability to repay? So it bounces back to us in terms of what is it that you can do? So it shows the potential of what can be done. Okay, but what you need is to the realization of that to actually, you know, be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, change perceptions. 
So so it, it shows the potential. Like if you started reforms, for example, to increase your bankable net of like of who your ta of like you know your tax net of who you are able to capture. Uh, that's a good thing because it shows okay you're starting but this is the potential. But uh, if you have if you're not able yet to tap into that, how would this change the assessment based on just the potential, but not having realized it. So I think we need to also, when, we, when we're thinking about this, we need to also think of what is the counter argument. Yeah. Okay, the counter argument about what they might come, what, what might be said back. That, that's fair. Um, I'm gonna bring in, uh, I'm gonna bring back uh, Ms. Zhang Ting Ting, um, because obviously China is also a, a country where there are now 52 um, domestic credit rating agencies some of them, only a few of them, do sovereign ratings of other countries. Um, but and and Chongqing is one of those. Um, from your perspective, what lessons could uh, African credit rating agencies or others? How could they also, or and also the big three? How can they shift in terms of the methodologies? Uh, from the Chinese rating agencies and how how to even work to utilize those uh, different types of um, ratings and methodologies to uh, make finance fundamentally more more affordable for for African countries. Well, we do know that the current sub rating system is defined by big three, and it is it is often challenged for you know being biased towards the emerging markets. I think it does capture the factors of the current global system that is dominated by the advanced economies and the dollar. But as we are standing at the crossroads of an old world turning to a new world, so it is very important for us to have a different view on the sovereign system, to reflect this kind of new factors of the new world. And also for the African credit rating agency, it is also, they can also play a very critical role in terms of bridging the gap between the local issuers and the international investors and creating a different sovereign system that can both capture the features of the African continent and also you know, get accepted by the in, uh, international investors is very critical. So for example, the African CRA can help to better assess and calculate the skills of these informal economies in Africa, uh, which make it more transparent to the global investor. And so talking about the last question related to Pentagon market, we do consider that the African issuers and especially the African MDBs at this stage do have a great potential in exploring this market. Uh, because, you know, the Pentagon market is designed for its position to attract those high quality issuers to this market. Well, you know, compared with the uh, African sovereigns or, you know, enterprises, African MDBs do enjoy a higher credit rating performance. Well, they, for the other, you know, African sovereigns and enterprises, they can also enter this market through the guarantee of these MDBs. But, you know, uh, for the majority African issuers, you know, if uh, as a tiny CRA, if we have a direct cooperation with African CRAs, and that can definitely help us to better understand the assets, the credit performance of the African sovereigns and, the, you know, uh, corporates and, you know, in financial institutions. And that will definitely help the Chinese, you know, investors to get better understanding of these African issues, so help them better get access to the private financing in China. So very much looking forward to such kind of opportunity in the future to cooperate with this African CRA. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. So hope you have uh, fruitful discussions in this panel. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that's I mean, again, sort of diversifying the conversation a little bit as well, kind of beyond the big three about also thinking about, and and I think Paolo was also helping us think about that link between 
the agency, the credit rating agencies and the and the investors and the diversif di diversification of investors on the African continent. And again, thinking about what different different investors might be thinking about what they even care about. And maybe there are certain aspects of ratings that some investors might care about more than others. Um, so I think that's actually also a very interesting perspective um, for us to be thinking about going forwards. Um, at this point, uh, I know uh, we are kind of running uh, a little bit close to time. Uh, we should be finishing uh, in around 15 minutes. So I want to see if there's any uh, questions from the audience or uh, in person or online. Otherwise, I'll continue to take the moderator's <laughs> prerogative. Um, but do we have any questions from, from our audience here or online? Yes. Thank you. Um, really um, interesting uh, discussion. And I think it was Dr. Uh, Sifo who uh, suggested that UNECA could take a role in um, verifying the methodology of um, credit rating agencies within the continent. Just be interested to know if there's any work going on on that or what the components of, uh, of that sort of methodology should be. What, what are the key things within the rating methodology that um, African agencies and the panelists would like to see. Thank you. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Um, yeah, just to echo sentiments, really, really enjoyed the panel. Thank you so much. Um, I was just chatting to my colleague at the Africa Union. I'd be keen to hear some of your thoughts around the work that the APRM is doing, right? Because I think they're trying to tackle um, some of the issues we've been discussing this afternoon. Um, and then secondly, sort of just listening to the conversation, it sounds to me like there's almost like a two-pronged approach that needs to be taken to this, right? Um, the one prong is some of the short-term things, all right, around making sure that correct data is available, um, as well as I think some of the work that could be done around questioning and correcting for the methodology. Um, and then in the long term, drawing from what Dr. Morsi said, how can we establish some of our credit rating agencies? We don't have the history, right, that some of these have. Um, so I'd be keen to hear your thoughts around, with that in mind, if we were to sort of um, have an, a collective approach to this, right, given that we are in DC and ministers of finance, um, what would your recommendation be in terms of how to, how to navigate um, those tensions? Okay, two excellent questions, and I think provide a lot of um, a lot of opportunity for response from from our panelists. Um, Dr. Falala, I'm going to come to you first. Um, in terms of in terms of the the opportunities for establishing better methodologies, what's your view, and and also again, what is your what what are your thoughts in terms of the of collective engagement, perhaps by governments. Yes, uh, thank you very much for those uh, questions. Uh, the API are what are the common, is the common thread that runs through these methodologies and what applies more to Africa and what applies less less so. So the challenge is uh, for them to try and do this uh, more rapidly. Uh, we are also involved as a part of a, a BRICS initiative. They have put on a table a methodology that uh, the APRM is also aware of. Um, so whatever methodology is used, it needs to have resonance. And the biggest challenge that people have is facing is the vacuum effect of for in um one after I'm sorry, Dr. Falala. And no. in order to improvement, I mm -hmm. think what the PRM is looking at. I'm sorry, the connection isn't great. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Maybe if you could if you could go back a little bit on what you were saying in terms of of APRM. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Um, so what can have a sweet spot in terms of deleting or eliminating the vacuum effect? And the vacuum effect is a very important principle because when you're looking at Africa, the biggest problem is the pace of development and the spread of underdevelopment. And the vacuum effect was created by the fact that we've had ratings for many years, but after 10 years, years there is no effect um, on the fundamentals. The methods that are being considered should then in some way uh, have a bearing on decision making, the speed of decision making. And these are some of the considerations on the table. However, what I would like to advise is that we need to see more rapid decision making, certainly by APRM. If you look at where we are on average, we are at least uh, in Europe and, and behind the United States in terms of just having a credit rating agency that can be trusted on the continent. And for that reason, we cannot afford to be making a decision by 2063. So we don't have time. So the decision that will be made will probably be a good decision, but just maybe 50 years too late. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Morrissey, did you have did you have some thoughts in terms of the the two questions that were Post or Paolo as well, I think you might want to come into. Uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the work that ECA is, is doing, we are working closely with the Africa peer review mechanism on many of these issues. So there's a lot of joint work in terms of benchmarking, looking at methodology and so on, and that's available, including, you know, in reports that we've jointly done together. So you can look into that. Um, I think um, on the second question, I think in the short term, we know what we need to do. In the long term, uh, it's a long journey and we need to invest in it um, in, in order to really build the trust, credibility and robust track record that then, you know, um, at the end, you need to remember the client of these credit rating agencies are investors to the extent that, you know, uh, who do investors feel are the most credible, okay? If they need to make a decision where they put their money, whether they're domestic or international, who do they have the trust of? So it, this this type of you know trust and credibility takes years to you know to to gain. So uh, we need to kind of you know start to invest in it and uh, continue. Thank you, Paolo. Did you have any thoughts on this question? Um, and it sounds like what we're talking about is you know making new African credit rating agencies being 21st century organizations, but still having the credibility and the basis of the 20th century ones, even if they're old. That's why I have a, a, a certain preference for uh, uh, not to come up with a new Pan-African uh, uh, rating agency. My preference would be to uh, to create a, 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 a favorable environment for the existing one to grow and to uh, become more, um, uh, I would say, uh, not sophisticated, but to bring that um, context, African context more in the operation, um, rather than creating a new entity that run the risk to be, again, loaded by some political consideration in our in our continent let's be realistic this is not a criticism i have myself work in helping set up an african institution so i believe in it but i, I think that the, the the universe that we have now from augusto some in south africa bloom bloomfield in west africa and others i think we have some critical mass we can work on nice to find maybe a a, a mechanism to 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 bring that, that oversight that Mr. Mossi was saying, uh, Dr. Mossi was saying. The other thing I think it's important is 
to in that process of homework is to work with our countries to know that having a rating, whether it's a shadow rating and others, is not an expenditure, it's an investment. Um, so by doing that, uh, it, it will enable also our countries not to go begging for money to do the rating. You know, we, many of our countries can afford doing the rating. But there is that tendency immediately when you want to do it is to start apl applying, you know, going, finding trust funds. We, we have to move away from that mindset because it's an investment, uh, not just an expenditure. So that's an additional thing that I wanted to bring in the conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, again, um Mr. Babatunde, I'm not sure if you're still online. I wondered what your thoughts are on on the implications for an agency like yours in terms of this almost like a two-step process um, and how you're also engaging with APRM as well in their work on an African credit rating agency. Thank you. Um, though we are probably disposed to um, the discussion around the um, setting up uh, the agency. But it's uh, important to also mention, like the last speaker said, Augusto Anko has been in the system for over 32 years, and we have uh, tracked data over this uh, long period of time from, for many African nations. And uh, beyond the um, international ratings, which we are talking about, we have done uh, domestic ratings for sub-national, uh, that is what we call states. We have 36 states in Nigeria, for instance. We have rated over 24 of them, and we have rated uh, 10 counties in um, Kenya. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, one year, we are still going to rate another 10. So the capacity is here, which we are developing, oh, oh, uh, and which can be better. Of course, we cannot, um, deny the fact that those who have been in the system for over 100 years, we always uh, provide some, um, we have some advantages, but African rating agencies will also grow, provided we provide the necessary um, encouragement and patronage, even from Africans. If we believe in ourselves, we can actually go very far. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that's a great point to um, finish our panel discussion and now turn to uh, now turn to Mr. Jean Paul, or Honorable Jean Paul Adam, um, who has been patiently uh, listening to all of these discussions and has um, the great challenging task of summing up and giving us the sort of rounding up of, of what we can take away from today. Um, John Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're at the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa at the UN. Um, you're also a former Minister of Finance and dealt with credit rating agencies, I'm sure, in your previous role. Um, please do, I'm going to pass on to you to help us close today and um, help set us up for our collective next steps. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hannah, and uh, good afternoon and greetings from New York. Um, it's a great pleasure to join all of the uh, fantastic speakers who we've already heard from, and I'd just like to congratulate you all and thank you for the richness of the discussion. And uh, as Hannah said, I will share a few perhaps a few key takeaways based on the discussions and then add a few of my, my own perspectives. And I would just like to also convey the greetings of the Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on Africa to the Secretary General, Christina Duarte, who very much wanted actually to participate herself, uh, but was uh, very kind to ask me to do so because uh, she was actually traveling at this time. And uh, so I wish I could have been with you in, in Washington, but uh, just down the road in, in New York, um, I, working closely with uh, African countries, I think a lot of the things that have been highlighted today, I think, are, are of great importance. Uh, firstly, I think it's very obvious to any observer, and which has been eloquently underlined by all of our speakers today, that there is a, a risk perception problem in Africa, which translates, has real world consequences, into um, a Africa premium which uh, means that African countries are paying a higher rate to access international capital markets, and which is actually not reflective of the reality of investing in Africa. And I think uh, 
uh, Malado did uh, share that absolutely, I think, um, very excellent example of how, uh, and I think this is across the, the natural resource extractive sectors across the continent, is that because this represents a real predictable flow of, in, of uh, revenues and uh, commodities that have a global value, uh, that reflects, in fact, a, uh, a certainty of investment going forward. And that means that the, the the premium associated with African economies is overstated because a lot of the factors that feed into the ratings are subjective ones, including the point, for example, on uh, how to define political risk. And I, I'm very struck that, for example, in uh, in countries outside of Africa, you may also have, let's say, um, disputed elections. And do those translate into credit down rates? Not in the same way that it does in Africa. They may have an impact, but the impact, the subjective impact of that analysis is multiplied uh, in Africa. And allow me to refer to the, the work done by uh, one of the credit rating agencies, Moody's, that actually showed, based on objective data, that the default rate of capital infrastructure projects in Africa was actually lower than, lower than Europe and lower than Latin America and lower than Asia. Uh, so the the real return on investment in certain sectors uh, is not reflected in the credit rating methodologies that are used. I think another aspect which uh, came out very strongly um, based on the, um, the excellent interventions by, by Ting Ting is that regional differences are an advantage of approach, meaning that they allow for specificity and they allow also for uh, addressing uh, the particular institutional needs of, of regions. And I think this is going to be particularly crucial as we move forward with the implementation of the African continental free trade area and as we want to see more intra-African investment. And I think this is one of the areas that I would like to focus on as well in terms of next steps, that a lot of the ways in which we can reduce the perception of risk across the continent will also to uh, facilitate real investments happening within Africa by African institutional investors, whether it be pension funds or uh, sovereign wealth funds and, and, so, and so forth. And I uh, also uh, noted, and I think this is related, that the work of credit rating agencies is feeding into essentially what is a global process that reinforces the core periphery uh, relationship that has existed and which uh, is perhaps more pronounced in an African context also because of the history of colonialism and therefore the structure of economy of the African economies um, are very much aligned around the extraction and export of resources at the expense of more value addition in value chains and therefore this means that global shocks are interpreted as having a bigger impact on African countries and the uh, there should not be an assumption that the credit rating agencies are going to take into account the realities or specificities of Africa. And the only way to address that is to empower credit rating agencies, firstly, that are already active within the African continent. But I think it is worth as well underlining the work being done um, for an African credit rating agency through the work of APRM uh, in that having the uh, the the value of methodologies which are specific to the African continent. And I do note and agree with the point of the necessity of really empowering the, the, um, the private sector credit rating agencies already act, uh, active on the continent and making sure that we don't crowd out through a regional approach uh, which is uh, which is led by institutions, but rather provide um, benchmarking, which I think was a point that was underlined by Hanan, uh, and also ensuring that the credit ratings are based on data which is credible and which is realistically able to be provided by African countries. Also taking into account some of the data aspects which are currently not uh, fully taken into account in the context of the existing big three credit rating uh, agencies. And, the, and, and this includes factoring in, in some cases, the informality of African economies. But that informality does not mean that it does not generate wealth or that that wealth does not reach uh, populations or that it does not contribute to the predict predictability of access to resources. So I think a few key points uh, going forward. The need for 
reinforcement of uh, credit rating agencies within the African continent, both building on the APRM process for an African credit rating agency, but also reinforcing the capacities of existing credit, credit rating agencies and, and uh, enhancing their opportunities to engage with, uh, with countries across the continent and recognizing the specificities of Africa. Uh, reinforcing the availability of data and using uh, data as a means of uh, of delivering accountability for African governments vis-a-vis -vis their citizens, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis partners and potential investors. And lastly, allow me to conclude with uh, with a few key thoughts. I think that the challenge we face with credit rating agencies is fundamentally a systems problem. Uh, we are reinforcing the fact that there are 500 to 600 billion dollars worth of um, of financial resources that are actually leaving the continent every year and which are not mobilized in various forms. This includes illicit financial flows, but it also includes inefficient taxation, inefficient management of natural resources. Those resources usually end up at some form, whether legally or illegally, they end up in institutions in the global north. And then these resources are then often reinvested in Africa at a premium. So essentially, one of the main systems changes that we need to make is to mobilize effectively the resources that are already across the African continent, but deploy them in a institutionalized way uh, to the, the priority and the imperative of uh, African uh, sustainable development. By no means is this a simple uh, process and by no means it is, is it something that is, uh, th that is immediate, but it is something which is based around building country systems which can help reinforce as well the uh, predictability of, of resources available to African countries and the predictability as well of engagement with credit rating agencies, both within the continent and without. Thank you so much for having given me the opportunity to participate in this really vibrant and wonderful discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Paul, for closing our discussion today and all that leaves for me to do is to say thank you very much to our wonderful audience for staying with us um, here in the room in DC and also online and say thank you very much to our amazing panelists uh, for all of your insights, varying perspectives and I think that was actually very healthy um, to have different perspectives coming across um, and but most importantly as well let me say thank you very much to uh, Malada Kaba and uh, Faleme Conseil for partnering with us uh, in bringing this together. And we look forward to a lot more collaboration with all of you and, um, and you especially, Malado. Thank you. <laughs>